Good Monday morning to you. As Pastor Tom covered Jeremiah and Isaiah last week, I'm going to continue working through some of the prophets that coincide with the story. Now we're a little bit out of order, um, so I'm going back to the 8th century. This is um, beginning uh, 722 to 7 or 756 to 722. Uh, we are introduced to the prophet Isaiah. Or, sorry, to the prophet Amos. Amos shows up in 2 Kings chapter 17. So um, we have a lot of characters that we haven't talked about. Uh, kings of Israel, kings of Judah. Remember the two kingdoms are still split. Um, and many of them are doing evil in the sight of the Lord, right? And so we know that there's going to be another exile that happens. So in 2 Kings 17, from verse 21 to 23, we read this. Uh, when, when he had torn Israel from the house of David, they made Jeroboam, son of Nebat, king. This is Jeroboam II. Uh, Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them commit great sin. The people of Israel continued in all the sins that Jeroboam committed. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight. And he had, as he had foretold through all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria under, until this day. So this is the great um, Syrian empire, a Syrian empire that takes over all of Israel, all of the promised land. And, um, and we'll kind of go through that a little bit. But Amos is the prophet that is discussed. So if you're looking at your Bible and you're thinking, okay, we're in 2 Kings and then we have to turn to Amos, um, it's important to know that the Old Testament is not in a chronological order. Sometimes people get confused by that. So when you read the Bible from cover to cover, um, sometimes it, it's a little confusing as to what's happening when because it's not in chronological order. You have three prophets that are put later in the, the canon of the Old Testament that actually exist earlier in the story. I don't know why, because there's a bunch of guys sitting around the table and they put the books in order and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But here we are. Uh, so if you turn to your Bible, Amos is a beautiful book. Uh, he is one of th the four major prophets um, that that speak into this time of of preparing for exile, being in exile, coming out of exile. Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah all have this kind of um, earlier theme. Um, you know, there's a historical understanding that Amos is all about justice and. Uh, he has this kind of sense of justice and religious response. Um, Amos is the book that is used most often by churches wanting to focus on social justice issues. And, and I'm going to speak to that at the end of this, um, but it's there's so many good passages throughout the book of Amos that make for that case, right? This is a prophet for social injustice. Right off the bat, um, Amos is reminding the people that they uh, have sinned. In fact, in chapter 1, um, verses 3 and uh, verses 3, it says, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. And there's almost like an amen, right? Um, because they have thrashed Gilead. So sometimes the prophets would come and they would say, repent and uh, God will show mercy. Um, Amos is not such prophet. There would seem like there's no repentance at this point. It does not matter if you were to turn away. Your sins have, uh, have led the path before you. Uh, that's not considering that God is an unjust God. It's saying that um, Amos is the response for the actions and how God is working in that response is pretty fascinating. So throughout the book of Amos, you'll have all of these um, social injustice themes. Uh, in, in verse 7, you'll see a comment about slave trading um, because they carried into exile the entire community. So remember, uh, we were a little concerned that Solomon developed slave trading with a people who had once been slaves. Um, there's a lot of history, historical anomalies that exist, uh, much like our lives, right? How many times do we make the same mistake over and over again or generation from generation? Uh, it happens again. In verse 9, um, they talk about Tyree and the slave labor there. Um, in fact, Amos is speaking to a, a, a people that are so impressed, so oppressed, that in chapter 2, verse 8, you actually see how oppressed they are. 
They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. That means that the people are so poor, they're literally pledging the shirt off their back to make a debt. And when they fail, they, they have to give that. Um, it's a, a reality to the, the slave life in the Old Testament that we they always gloss over. And sadly, this is what comes up again uh, when slave trading becomes popular. Um, you know, in our country's history as well, slaves are actually brought naked. There's a shame in the slaving. And so people had to pledge their own garments just to pay their debts. In chapter 4 of Amos, there's a call to worship. You know, chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal and multiply transgressions. There's this call in to worship. But the response, and it's a theme that goes all through chapter 4, you'll see this response in verse 6 and 8, uh, 9, 10, 11. The response is, God did this, and yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. So every petition is, you know, I gave you this, and you didn't return to me. I also did this, and you didn't respond to me. Um, I sent I sent locusts, I sent punishment, and you didn't respond. I overthrew some of you, you didn't respond. So not just the positives, but even the challenges that the people have faced, nowhere in their response to the good or the bad, or even the ugly, did they respond to the Lord. And then the, the one verse that everyone seems to know Amos for is that verse that gets coined on so many different placards and campaigns. It comes in chapter 5, it's verse 24. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And there's this sense that that's, that is what, um, what, what social justice should look like, like ever-flowing waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. What's important to remember that Amos was both a response to the social justice and a worship of the righteous. One cannot be devoid of other. And, and really, in our modern society, that is what we most find troubling about um, campaigns that turn our focus solely in one direction. Because it always is God leading us to that direction. It always is God putting a, a, a plight before us so that we can respond to it in faithfulness. Those two are always in tandem. They cannot be separated from one another. So in this morning, can you relate? Uh, the story of Amos, can you relate to a faith that is bigger than yourself? Because really that's the story of Amos. That's the prophecy that he most helps us in, in our um, understanding today to think about. Amos called to action that, you know, faith was not just about our simple rituals or how we were handled, but how our community was developed how we were supporting and caring for everyone. You know, when Solomon introduced the slave labor, it was great for the majority of people because they didn't have to do work they didn't want to do. But if you were on the fringe, if you were, you know, indebted, if, if you couldn't one day pay your taxes, then you were cast into this uh, response and, and everyone else kind of washed their hands of you. We have a little bit of that today, right? There are people who are uh, without homes, who are homeless, who have uh, addiction issues, and, and we kind of think well, this is their choice. Um, certainly there are people that seem to just want to live that lifestyle. But there are a lot of people who don't. Uh, I think the statistic I once heard was every, every person is three decisions away from homelessness. Um, and, and that's a pretty broad statement to make, but I don't know, does that fit in your life? I, I kind of worry, uh, what if that fits in my life? There's a reality to what Amos speaks to us this day, that we have a call in our faith to look at the world around us. And if the world is too big, let's just start with Salem. How about let's just start with South Salem? Are we responding in faithfulness to all of God's people or just the people that walk through our door? Or how about just the people that look like us or the people we know their names or the people where we know the neighborhood in which they live? Uh, can you relate to Amos is a little bit of a challenge because it, it causes us to be a little bit more introspective on how we live on our faith individually. Um, and, but also, you know, 
how do we live out our faith as a congregation? I'm not suggesting we put up banners or, or, or create rallies or, or do any of those things that a lot of social justice churches tend to um, champion. Um, I'm, I'm asking us to look at who we are at the heart of who we are. And are we responding with an Amos-like perspective? Are we looking at the world and investing in it, caring? Or, or are we living into that theme that's so prevalent in chapter 4? Yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. May everything that we do, all of our focus, be about returning to God and the good and the bad and the ugly. Have a great Monday.